let's try that. Let's try again. Welcome. Um, yeah, so it's if you're uh, here in the morning in your time, good morning. If you're here in the evening, well, hopefully I haven't spoiled your dinner. And uh, because it's Perth, um, afternoon tea time for me. So wherever you are coming from the world, in fact, if you want, you can use the chat and I'd be curious to see what country you're coming from. Um, mainly so just for my interest and also I can exploit it and, and put it back in my KPIs that I had people from all over the world. So feel free to put in the chat line what country you're coming from. Um, but if not, that's fine. I don't, I don't mind if you prefer to remain anonymous. So this is the DBA uh, office hour session. Um, feel free that uh, if you can't hear anything or the video goes bad or anything that, that doesn't seem to be working well, just um, slam it into the chat line and I'll see if I can resolve it. Um, hopefully I've got the microphone and the webcam and everything pretty much sorted out. Um, I'm going to try some new things today with the, with the webcams because I bought a second webcam and we'll see how we go. So in terms of questions, let's see what we've got. We had a few come in earlier. Um, obviously you can put in whatever questions you want in there. Um, I'll just share the screen so you have an idea for what we're going to be talking about at least initially. There we go. So these are the questions that came in earlier through the Ask Tom Office Hours, um, uh, Office Hours page. Um, I will say if you do have questions, obviously you can obviously just put them on Ask Tom if ever you want to. But if you feel you'd like to have them discussed in an Office Hours session, I always encourage people to put them on in advance. Um, mainly because hopefully I can give you a better answer. Um, we can, I can reach out to PMs inside the organization or it just lets me do some slides in advance. There's a few of these questions that I thought I really couldn't answer just verbally today. So I thought I'd um, do a few slides in advance or, or drag some slides out from the existing presentations just to hopefully give you guys a, a, a better experience and a, and a better answer. So because it's a DBA topic, you know, we pretty much take questions on just about anything. Um, last month I did one on partitioning in particular, uh, but this month I thought we'd just leave it, leave it blank and people can ask whatever they want. So we got a, an interesting mix up there. Of course, besides the fact that someone's bagging me about Ask Tom not taking questions as frequently as I like, but I'll, I'll, I'll even cover that one off as, as well and we'll see how we go. So um, we'll jump straight into it now and we'll stop recording. I didn't want to do that. The chat. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll go through these questions. Feel free to add, um, comments or refinements in the chat, far away, whatever you like, and we'll try to get to all of them, um, or brand new questions, I don't mind. Um, and if we finish on the hour, fine. If we finish before the end of the hour, even better, I suppose, for me and, and for you. So we'll see how we go. So there's our list. I'll take it off screen now, and I'll leave it on screen until we um, start talking about a few things. So the first one is, should I wait for 18, or should I upgrade to 12.2? Uh, Let's stop the share. So, Here's my thoughts uh, on that. I'm just making sure I can read my notes here as well. I've, just so people don't think I'm biased because I work obviously inside Oracle and, and it's fairly obvious that it's in our interest to have people upgrade as frequently as possible or be as close to the most recent versions as often as possible. Um, it reduces our support effort, etc. So I just wanna rest assured that I'm gonna try to put aside that bias because before I've only been at Oracle for two years, before that I've worked with Oracle products for about 20 years, almost exclusively in the private sector around the world. So I know the pain. I know the thing of when you've got a version of Oracle that's running just fine and someone says, well, it's coming up to out of support or it's, you know, it's getting a bit old or there's a particular feature, but it's only in the next version, etc." there's that you want to upgrade, but also you know that there's that risk factor involved and there's gonna be a big effort. And obviously, often as DBAs, we're not the people that control the decision-making process. We can go to our management and say, look, I'd like to move to version X of the product. And they say, well, we haven't got the budget for that. And what's the risk and, and what do we gain, et cetera. So I, I used to be of the opinion, and this is for, for many years of my working life, that. If I had a version of Oracle that was working fine, I would do as little as possible to that version. Um, and, and I think that's a, a common theme with DBAs. We're, we're naturally cautious people. So why rock the boat? If I have a perfectly working product, why would I upgrade to the next version or apply a patch set even unless something is really mandating me to do it? 
that obviously has the benefit of obviously less effort as well. If I can upgrade only once every few years, you know, most of the time when we're working in systems, we have these giant, you know, they, they become giant projects. I have a friend just in Perth recently and they're embarking on a 11G to 12 project. And I had lunch with her and she said, yeah, it's a two year project. I just about fell off my chair. You know, I, I honestly believe that no upgrade project should take two years, but you know, that, that seems to be the case. But so that's what I've, I've, I've you know, I, I sympathize with that concept of let's not upgrade unless we absolutely have to. And most of the places I worked, we got, you know, we were on 11.2 and we didn't go to 11.204 until all the other versions were out of support. And then, you know, we're going to stay on 11.2 for as long as possible. Now, I've changed my tune on that. And this isn't just because I've joined Oracle. I changed my tune about, well, I reckon five years ago. And that was, I'm now a big fan on upgrading actually quite frequently and, and quite um, almost as, as versions and patches come out. Now, that may raise alarm bells for people thinking, my God, that's just a huge amount of effort and what about the risk factors involved? But I'll, I'll try to justify why I think you should um, upgrade generally as soon as releases come out or, or there or thereabouts. When you upgrade less often, I don't think you actually save on testing effort because when you're going from say 10.2 to 12.2 or even 11.1 to 12.2, et cetera, it is a big jump. It's often a big jump. For example, we've gone from single tenant to multi-tenant and we'll talk about the multi-tenant stuff later on today. It's a big jump and understandably, I think the risk profile is much larger. And so that's why people do get scared of the big testing effort. And don't get me wrong, I think Oracle, and I obviously work for the company, we've occasionally shot ourselves in the foot when just a minor patch set has actually sort of had a large functional increase. And then if you've done any reading of the various blogs out there regarding 18C and onwards, we, you know, we, we accept that. We're trying to address that by doing smaller incremental pieces of functionality now with the newer versions from 18C onwards, hence the renaming 2018. So we, don't get me wrong, I totally accept that there's been times in the past when 11.202 to 11.203 had some fundamental change in, in the kernel somewhere, which you know, for some people caused all sorts of problems. But I think we, ex we acknowledge that and we're trying to improve upon that. But I reason to think I'll be, people want to be upgrading relatively quickly and relatively frequently is the change in functionality will be smaller. So the testing effort should be less. The other thing is, I think you actually get a more responsive um, support from Oracle itself. I know people love jumping on the criticized support bandwagon. Um, and, and I used to be guilty of the same thing. I, you know, I'd get upset with um, Oracle support from time to time. But having now worked on Ask Tom for a couple of years, um, I realized that it is amazing how much you get questions that are support related in terms of how would I do this? Why isn't this working? And yet w flying blind with someone's question, which simply says, this, this is the error message I'm getting. What's the problem? without knowing every single thing that led up to that point in terms of what the applications are, et cetera, is really, really hard. So I, I do have a, a much more sympathetic eye towards support now, but if you think about your support experience, if you're on a version of Oracle that very few people are still on and you're jumping to the latest version of Oracle, you know, I would much rather be in the camp of 1 million customers that are upgrading from 11.204 to 12.2 than 12 customers or 10 customers who are going from 10 105 patch set four, patch set three, bundle patch two with two other special one off patches to 12 two, right? You're in a tiny, a very small group of customers with that particular upgrade path. The likelihood of you finding interesting or anomalous behavior during that upgrade is probably higher than if you're in the soup with thousands and thousands of other customers and also internally when Oracle's doing a lot of its regression testing, we're gonna be doing the vast majority of our regression testing on the standard path. You've gone from 11 to 02, 203, 204, 1201, et cetera. So I think you'll get A, less problems, but if you do encounter a problem, you'll get a much better experience, much better access to expertise within the support organization because there's a lot more volume of knowledge about those particular standard paths. So if you start skipping lots of jumps, I think you're actually heading into a riskier territory, not just because you sort of get to end of life and then to support things, but putting all that aside, you actually just get to a greater risk profile. So for me, I think upgrading sort of steadily and frequently 
and still with a mind to doing good testing, um, I think is a very, that's a, a, a more sound approach in my opinion. The other one is, the reason I believe this is the case is, the most common criticism that Oracle takes when people do upgrades is not necessarily, it's, it's you know, occasionally people get Oracle 600s and kernel problems and things like that, or, or you know, crashes. But the vast majority of issues that in my working life I've always had when I upgrades is change in performance. And obviously that's related to SQL performance. Now, there's been a lot of work, and I stress that you should go read blogs.oracle.com slash optimizer. That's Nigel Bayless runs the blog now. There's been a lot of work we've been doing in Oracle uh, since 12.1 to improve the way the optimizer stability works as you move through upgrades. And, and don't get me wrong, that's an acknowledgement of the fact that we probably screwed up a bit when we went from 11.2 to 12.1. You know, we had a great swag of new ideas for the optimizer in terms, you know, in terms of its adaptability, but we shipped 12.1 with them all turned on. And so you know, for a whole lot of people, half their systems got a whole lot better and half their systems got a whole lot worse. And that's the thing that everyone remembers, obviously. You know, pain is much more has much more longevity. So after that stinging you know, response from our customers, we put a lot of work into making a much more smoother optimization path when you go to 12.2 and onwards. And in particular, one piece of technology which is so underused, incredibly underused, which I think is an awesome piece of technology, is SQL plan management and SQL plan directives. And, and I was at a, a user group meeting uh, the other day and, and some of the customers gave me a hard time because I said, if you've upgraded from 11 to 12 and you've got performance problems, then it's your own fault. And people didn't like this, but here's, here's my view on this is with SQL plan management, you can lock down the plan that you're currently having in version 11 to make sure that when you upgrade to 12, you get exactly the same plan. Right? And, and people have often worked around this by setting optimizer features enabled to 11 when they move to 12. But even if you set optimizer features enabled to 12, if you lock down your critical SQLs or SQL plan management, they're going to run the same plans when you move to 12. And I ask people, why don't you do this? And they're generally saying, well, it sounds too complicated or I didn't really know about SQL plan management, et cetera. And, and it's probably true we haven't advertised it as well as we could have in terms of a, a mechanism for upgrading. Um, often we've pushed the, the model, of if you want stable plans, SQL plan management but we probably haven't pushed the message of if you want stable plans across upgrades for the sole purpose of moving to upgrades, um, we probably haven't advertised it that well for that. But it's a very cool technology for exactly that purpose. Lock down the critical plans, move to 12. You may choose to leave them there forever. Um, you know, in my view, you would slowly ease up some of the plans um, such that you know, over time you would see maybe 12 can do a better job with some of them. But by having those SQL plan management directives in place, you can lock the plans in. Obviously, there's the opposite situation. If you've got a terrible 11 system, it's just running like a dog, then why wouldn't you move to 12? Like Things aren't going to get worse. If you've got a terrible system running 11, I'd move to 12 and take advantage of all those new optimizer things. Sure, there's probably going to be a couple of regressions, but you would hope that the vast majority of bad SQLs would be the same or better by moving to the new version. So there's my thoughts on, on upgrading more frequently, which of course comes to the fundamental question is, do I go 12.2 or do I go 18C? For me, I would start looking at 18C today. Now, obviously you can't do it on premise at the moment unless you're an Exadata customer. If you are, lucky for you, good luck to you. But there's nothing to stop you from running 18C in the cloud. Now, don't get me wrong, I can, you know, I can see everyone leaving the call going, oh, here we go, cloud sales pitch. Not trying to sell you anything. Um, when Oracle 18 was in beta, I, have I had access to it inside the organization. I can run 18C databases, I can spool them up and the like. Now that it's production, it's actually harder for me to do so <laughs> because it's when you know, we're moving on to the next beta release and people are working on that. So to actually get access to a fully fledged 18C production environment for me is actually more difficult now that it's gone production. So I did what any of you can do, which is simply I went onto our cloud database. In fact, I can, let me. Um, this is just SQL Plus. And you know, as, I, as you can see, I chose a very secure password of system slash Oracle. But DB18 
is I went to cloudoracle.com, signed up for one of those free trials. That gives me a month of playing with an Oracle 18 database. So even if my organization is thinking, well, I can't get it on premise, I'm not Exadata, you know, I, I can't even look at 18, why would I even consider it in terms of an upgrade path? Well, I would say you can. You can jump on and start learning about the new features, but also, you know, with this uh, simple cloud database, and you can see it's just a normal database, etc. running SQL Plus. Um, what's my shared pool? Yeah, two gigs of shared pool. I think it's got seven gigs around this box, etc. It's just a stock standard Oracle database um, running 18C. I can play with the new features, but also I could actually load some of my existing data, my existing applications, just on a smaller scale, and just see if you know the more critical things are going to work. So I don't think there's an excuse to say 18C is not available on premise. I should do nothing about it. And the other reason I think you should probably you know, move through 12.2 and then to 18C is 18C is really just 12.202. Um, it's just a rebadged version. 18C is actually the first major patch set for 12.202. We've renamed it because it reflects this hopefully new model we're accommodating, which is every three months we'll get you bug fixes, improvements in stability, and incremental new functionality. So if I was, if Someone's asked me today, I'm on 11.2, what do I do? I would go get to 12.2, it's available on premise, start playing with 18C, but try, look toward whether your organization can adopt the advice that I'm giving you, which is rather than it's gotta be 12 or 18, it should be now we're gonna start incrementally looking at smaller, less risky upgrades, upgrades on a more frequent basis. Um, that's my, my thoughts on that question. So if you have any comments, throw them in the chat line. Otherwise, I will simply move on to the next one. The next question we had, where's my notes? What is a hybrid histogram? Okay, that's a doozy. That's, um, okay, hybrid histograms. Before I can tell you what a hybrid histogram is, I probably have to tell you how they evolved and how they came about um, in the evolution of how the optimizer works in Oracle. So here's an example that I've set up. I've created this fictitious table called orders. It's not part of the standard examples or anything. It's just one I created such that I could control the um, actual distribution of values. You can see that we've got eight statuses. And it reflects pretty much what would happen in a system where you can buy things. I've got a thousand new orders that haven't been touched by anything yet. Then they get assigned to someone um, to deal with or assigned to some process. And I imagine that'd be, a very, that'd be a very quick thing you get assigned and then someone starts working on the order. So very few people in the assigned category. Then they're in progress. I've got 4,000 orders. We're building things, constructing things, wrapping things, whatever. Whatever happens at, at retail places. And then the person that's finished constructing it says I'm done and it's processed. And very quickly, we try to get it shipped. So hopefully the number of wrote orders that are just staying as processed and therefore sitting there doing nothing is very low. Then they've been shipped out to customers. 5,000 people have then received their goods. And then we sort of complete, we mark that order as being completed. So we know how long we have to deal with it ever. It might enter a warranty period, etc. And then finally we archive them off, never to be seen again, off to our data warehouse and, and off we go. So that's, I'm um, hopefully I've picked the data distribution there, which is roughly what we'd expect. So there's our eight statuses. First thing we see is, oh, there's some skew there. And when we see skew, people panic and we think we've got to have histograms. So in 11G, I might choose to create a histogram. I've done for all columns size 15 because there's more, there's, there's not 15 values. As long as that columns number is larger than the number of distinct values, I'll get what's called a frequency based histogram. Now a frequency histogram doesn't require a lot of explanation. It's pretty much exactly what you would expect. It is we can store for each individual distinct value, we can store the actual frequency distribution. So there's a thousand new, there's 10 assigned, there's 4,000 in progress. We know exactly how they are at the time of gathering stats. We know exactly how many there are for each particular status. The way it's stored in the database is somewhat cryptic. Um, you can see we have a, call, a view called user histograms. And the way it works is it's actually the endpoint number 
is sort of like a cumulative total. And so the delta between them is actually how we store the frequency distribution. So you can see there that for, um, for n value of one for new, even though it says NEV, that's just part of the, the cryptic way we store character values in the um, histogram table. So we have a thousand for the frequency and a thousand for the endpoint number. For the second row of assigned, the endpoint number is 1,010. And so how we work out the frequency of 10 is it's 1,010 minus the previous value. So that's how we work it out. And as we move down, we have 4,000 in progress. We have three, um, pro sorry, three that are processed and so forth. The cool thing with a frequency histogram is because we know the exact distribution of each value, when I do an execution plan, generally the numbers are gonna be bang on. In fact, if I do select star from orders where the status equals shift, you can see the estimate was 800 and the true value is 800. That frequency histogram is actually spot on. As we said, so far so good. What happens now though, if we want to have a histogram of lots and lots of different values? Now I can mimic this with my existing example by saying, what if I don't have enough buckets? So normally, if the number of distinct values is greater than 254 in Oracle 11, and I've put the star next, I'll come back for a second, then obviously there's a limit of that many buckets. If I got more than say 300 distinct values, I can't store an exact frequency histogram for every single row, every single value. There's too many of them. That number's been lifted to, I think, 2000 in Oracle 12. I'm gonna mimic that now by saying, well, I've got eight distinct values, but I'm gonna say I'm only allowed to have six histogram buckets or, or ranges, so to speak. So I can't actually get eight distinct values into my histogram. What does Oracle do in Oracle 11? It creates a thing called a height balanced histogram. Now, if we look at that same view, user histograms, we can see there's sort of this quite odd information now. We don't get the values one through eight anymore. We get new, which is one, six and received, seven complete, and eight have archived. Uh, two, three, four, and five seem to have disappeared. And the endpoint number is effectively something a bit cryptic as well. It no longer seems to reflect the frequency. The best way of describing it is by looking at, hopefully, pictorially. We have six buckets, hence my terrible artwork, and we had to squeeze eight values into those six buckets. And if I just flip back, we have those endpoints 0, 1, 3, and 6. Jumping forward again, hopefully the zoom will keep up with that. What we're essentially saying is, is that values 1 to 6 would all fit in one bucket in terms of the total number of values. And value 7's complete would occupy two of the six buckets, effectively two, a third of the data. And the value 8 of archive occupies three of the buckets or half of the data. So because we simply didn't have enough buckets to store an individual frequency, we've done our best with this thing called a height balanced histogram. Once you start not being able to store exact numbers, that's when things can get a bit risky when it comes to histograms. So you remember there were actually 20,000 archived rows. The estimate came out at 19,000. It's reasonably good. Right. When I look at completed though, there was 10,000 and this time we were over by a factor of 50%. And it's a bit of a toss of a coin because this is effectively how it's working. If I've got 45,000 total rows in the table and I've only got six buckets, each bucket can give me information about 7,000 roughly rows. So archive being 20,000 values, worked out pretty nicely. It was, it was almost three evenly sized buckets. So in terms of estimates, we're gonna get lucky in the sense that the estimate is going to be pretty close to actually the reality. When I look at the complete, the true value of complete was 10,000, which is one and a half buckets. And obviously the definition of half a bucket isn't stored in the data dictionary. You know, we assume that seven spans two buckets, not one. That's the best we can do. And so once we start getting into numbers spanning lots of buckets or not filling a bucket for lack of a better term, like the seven, the value of seven there is, that's when our estimates start going askew. And in particular, once I look at a value that's not in the histogram at all, I have this value of two assigned, which was so small it didn't even fit in the histogram. It was all covered in that first bucket going from one up to six. 
we're miles off. There's only three values for two of a sign and the database estimates we're gonna get 1200. If that goes into a join condition, for example, we're probably gonna get a problem. If there's only three values, I probably wanna use a nested loop to get three values and then index drive into a secondary table. If the database thinks I'm gonna get 1200, it's probably gonna abandon a nested loop and go for a hash join. So it's when you start getting height balance histograms that those risks and those horror stories you hear about histograms start coming into play. So this is the sort of, you know, once, once you start getting histograms that can't accurately model your data, this is a slide I thought I'd put in just for a bit of fun. You know, the optimizer says, yep, I've got a histogram, height balance histogram for you, how can I help? And this is what people often think about of the, the optimizer when they have performance problems. Yeah, they just run screaming from the room saying, I wish the optimizer wasn't there at all. So bucket spanning is gonna be dramas and bucket swallowing, where multiple different values are all swallowed up in one bucket um, are where your estimates can go off. So that's what we had in 11, frequency and height balanced. And um, what that means is if, you're, if you are gathering histograms, and this is an 11 or 12, you may as well do for all column size 254, you may as well pick the largest number possible because ideally you want to get that frequency histogram. If you've got 200 distinct values, you may as well have a perfect histogram. If you've got more than 254, you're gonna get a height balance histogram no matter what. So you may as well go 254 always, if for those columns that you choose to have histograms on. So let's talk about 12C now, which is where hybrids came in. 12C, if you've got enough buckets, it's unchanged from 11. I've got eight distinct values. I asked for 15 buckets. I get a frequency histogram just as before, no change there. Let's now look at if I try six. So once again, I got eight distinct values. And in 11, when I said six buckets, I got a height balance histogram and some problems. Now I get a new thing called a top frequency histogram in 12, which is pretty cool. If I look at the spread now, I've got my six buckets still, but I've actually still stored some accurate frequencies. For values one, three, five, six, seven, and eight, so a new in progress ship received completed and archived, I've got the exact frequencies there. So optimizing for those values is gonna be bang on, just as good as a normal frequency histogram. Obviously there's a couple missing, number two and number four, what happened to them? So here's our six buckets, we get exact values. For the other ones, we can do a little bit of an approximation here. There's 45,813 rows in my table, and there's eight distinct values. I've managed to cover six of them with a frequency-based histogram, and that added up to 45,800 rows. So the database can use that information to say, well, I've got 13 rows left over and two distinct values left over, so I'm expecting to see seven rows in each. So even though I haven't stored frequency histograms for those two small number of rows, I can actually do a reasonable approximation at them. And that's what it does. If I do what's the number of processed rows, the estimate was seven, the true value was three, I'm looking pretty good there. I'm not nowhere near that 1200 rows I had with the height balance histogram. How does Oracle know when it can do this? It simply says if the percentage of the top number of values is greater than the number of buckets minus one, so all, all bar one of the buckets times the number of rows. So let's do that in some simple mathematics. If I've got 12 buckets, that means that the 12 most frequent values have to consume more than 11 twelfths of the thousand rows that we've got, for example. So we get top frequency, that's like the, the next step down. Ideally, I get a frequency histogram. If I can't get that, I'll try for a top frequency histogram. And what if that's not possible? What I've done now is taken my table and inserted a lot more values into it to make it fairly evenly distributed. Now, you could make an argument here that I probably don't need a histogram at all. If all the rows are evenly distributed, archive there is probably the exception. I could probably get away with no histogram and Oracle is gonna make a rough assessment there's probably about 12,000 rows per value. And that would probably be good enough. And this is one of those examples where you might think, maybe I don't need a histogram at all. But if I force one, if I look at the distribution there, there's not sufficient skew such that we could do a top end frequency histogram. So what happens is you get this thing called a hybrid histogram. 
And that hopefully is going to help answer this question. I can't do a frequency. I can't do a top, fre uh, top frequency. I'm going to do what's called a hybrid, which really is just an improved version of the height balanced histogram. What we have now is, how am I going for time? Oh man, I'm burning at my hour here. And I'm going to get to question two. Here it is. We'll speed up. Um, if anyone's getting bored with hybrid histograms, put it in the chat line, say, move on, but we'll keep on checking. I don't mind feedback of that sort. So now there's a new column in user histograms called endpoint repeat count. And probably best if we describe that with a picture. So what I'm doing now is, is I've got six buckets because I've got eight values trying to cram into six buckets. So I couldn't do frequency. I'm using hybrid. And what the hybrid stores is an additional piece of information saying that for the value I'm storing, so let's look at an example here, uh, the very last one, eight of archived. It says I've got 2,098 values in there, but the extra piece of information I'm storing is that 1,213 of them are for that particular value. So for the highest value in that bucket, which in this case is eight of archived, there's 2,000, 2,098 values in the bucket, which could span several things, but 1,200 of them are for that particular value, eight of archived. The reason that's useful, we'll see in the next slide, is what it's saying is 2,098 occurrences, 1,200 are ARC, which means there must be 885 between the previous value, which is six of received, which is the previous bucket, and less than this endpoint value. Now, in that case, we know there's only one thing between six and eight, and that's seven. But if there was several, it, the, the same logic applies. I'm getting better information from that one bucket because I know the perfect frequency histogram for one of the values in the bucket, and all the rest fall into this, this sort of um, category of unassigned. So 800 rows are between six and eight. The nice thing with that is, is values no longer span a bucket. So the value of eight won't span a bucket, it'll simply have an endpoint repeat count. Oh, and that's the end of hybrid histograms. So let me go back to the picture. So hybrid histograms are like a slightly improved version of height balanced histogram. Now, having said all that, let me wrap it up in a too long didn't read. Frequency histograms are probably gonna make your queries as optimized better. Top end frequency histograms are gonna make your queries optimized better. Height balanced histograms in 11G are risky areas. That's where when you've got histograms, you need to take care. There's a good chance that the histogram may make things worse, might make things better, but you really need to have a good look at each on a case by case basis. Hybrid histograms are an improved version of height balanced histograms, but still, same thing. That's generally where your risk profile is going to lie, right? If you're having performance problems and the columns involved in the predicates have histograms on them, if they're frequency histograms, I think you'll be fine. If they're height balanced or hybrid, take a closer look. You may be better off looking at something like SQL plan management to lock the plans into place or removing the histogram altogether. So there we go, height balanced histograms. Oh, holy moly. Man, where's the time going? Am I just am I pontificating too much? Am I rambling on too much? Probably. You can put that in the chat well as if you like. We're recording this session, but we'll, we'll chug along. The next question was, oh, in fact, I actually I wrote this question actually um on the slide because it's a massive question. This came in. Resource maps. This is the question that came in. Uh, I didn't want to that. Every night between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., we see resource managers setting the maintenance plan as well as weekends. We've seen during this time, slower response time compared to non-maintenance resource plan in effect. Can I disable the windows so we get the same response time for the whole week? And this is what the person is proposing and doing. So what's going on? Ever since, oh, 10.2, maybe 11, Oracle 11. Back in 10.2, um, was probably the first release where the database started doing things on your behalf. Uh, people will probably remember a thing called gather stats job, which was a scheduler job that just magically appeared in, 10, in version 10, which would do stats each night. And then what happened was in Oracle 11, um, we took that to the next level. What we did was we introduced this thing called automatic tasks. And 
it's one of those awkward things because you didn't see anything in scheduler jobs that, that looked clean. And so you thought, well, nothing's going on in the background. But this thing called automatic tasks came along. There was zero documentation in Oracle 11 about them, which was a bit of a bummer. Now it's fully documented in Oracle 12 and onwards, but it's been there since Oracle 11. And what happens is that each night during what we call these maintenance windows, we start doing stuff on your behalf. One of them is gathering stats. The other one you can see on the screen is we have an automatic space advisor and a SQL tuning advisor. So we go ahead and we do some stuff. And then really it's designed to make your database, um, dare I say, autonomous. But effectively it's for those environments where DBAs generally don't have a lot of time to look after them. Um, and I use the example of your average DBA, you know, in, in the good old days, your DBA you got given two databases to look after. And then as the process became easier, you know, no one said, well, you got more free time. Everyone said, there's another 500 databases to look after. So what happens is I find most DBAs, and this has been the story of my working life as well. I've got a couple of same mission critical ones. So they're the ones I spend a lot of time looking very carefully at and very carefully tuning and, and being much more hands-on. And I've got 400 other databases that are just lead to departmental kind of things, you know, that, you know, performance, 10 users, very low volume, et cetera. So I don't want to be bothered doing custom DBMS stats routine and, and customize this and customize that and a lot of hands-on stuff. I'll just leave all the defaults set. And that's what this is designed to do. It's a hands-off approach to looking after those databases that perhaps don't need that absolute utmost in optimal care. So we gather stats, we do space tuning and, and stuff like that. And when does it happen? It all happens during these things called windows. And it's the normal scheduler object of a window that we create. Yeah, so the next slide. Yeah, so I'll come back to that. So those windows by default, out of the box, assume you're running a business hours system. So out of the box, your windows are 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Monday to Friday and all over the weekend. And that's probably the first thing you'll want to maybe look at and, and looking at changing if you're on, a, I say, a 24-7 system. You may have a quiet period. I worked at a, um, a gambling website for a long time. And during the night was when people were most busy. You know, they're, they're, at, they're betting on a lot of overseas sporting events and stuff like that in Australia. So we changed our windows. In fact, I'll show you the script I did shortly, um, such that it wouldn't be doing that workload during those periods of time. Um, if you're not using any of this stuff, so hopefully everyone's using automatic stats collection. You've got to gather stats. And if you want to turn off stats collection, you would actually do it at a much more granular level. You know, lock those particular tables, lock that schema, et cetera. But you want the stats job always to be running because it's going to be doing very, very useful stuff. But if you're not using the space advisor or the SQL tuning advisor in any way, shape or form, you, know, you could actually choose to disable them. That's an option you could look at exploring. And the reason I say it doing possibly using it this way is the question that came in was, can I just change the windows to change the resource plan? I don't think that's actually going to do a lot of benefit. The window is still going to come active um, and it's still going to effectively be using resources. The reason your system is slowing down is not because it's disabling other stuff. It's simply burning a lot of IO most probably to doing these particular tasks. So if you're not using the space advisor, for example, you may choose to actually disable it. Um, the optimized one, I'd say everyone is using. Um, if you want to be absolutely brutal, you could actually disable the entire maintenance window group. That simply turns off all the maintenance stuff altogether. I wouldn't recommend that. That's a bad idea. Um, and in particular, that's one of those things that could be easily forgotten. And obviously, as each version of Oracle comes along and more tasks come along and more goodies come into those maintenance windows and you're not touching them, that's probably a bad idea. And especially if you then go log a call with Oracle saying, I've got this problem, you know, I've got a bad execution plan. And they go, oh, yeah, you haven't collected stats for three years. Then you're going to look a bit foolish. So I wouldn't recommend disabling, but I'm just letting you know it is possible to disable these at a task basis or even at an entire window basis. This is what I did at the place I was um, working where during the night was actually a busy night. And during the weekend, when there's a lot of sport activities on and horse racing and stuff, that people gamble a lot. Australia is the biggest gambling nation on earth, which shows how morally bereft we are. Not to worry. So this is what we did. We said, okay, rather than having our maintenance window going from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. every single night, we changed it to start at 5 a.m. And you can see this is what you do. You set attributes on the actual window itself. So for the Monday window, my mouse is going to work on here. I'm going to do a dry thing. Maybe not. 
So for the Monday window, oh, did I just move a slide? I did. For the Monday window, we start at 5 a.m. by hour being equal five. So we start at 5 a.m. when most of the overnight sport in Europe has completed. And then we change it rather than being four hours long. That's the next slide. We change the duration to being a two hour interval. So for us, we said, we're not prepared to suck up four hours every single evening and almost all the weekend doing maintenance jobs. You know, the impact could potentially be on our system very large. So what we did was we said, we'll go Monday to Friday, 5 a.m. till 7 a.m. And when 7 a.m. people start working again, so we wanted to quiet down. And we, on the window, on the, we only did an hour, I, I'm sorry, and only for a two hour period. So we've halved the amount of time. Now, you might be thinking, well, how do I decide? What, you know, do I need four hours? Do I need six hours? What, you know, what's the best balance? Those of you, I think, called DBA auto, auto task client. And what that is, is one row for each of those automatic tasks that are running, um, stats job, et cetera, et cetera. As well as having one row in there, it also says over the last seven days, what is, is it auto tasks? So DBA auto task client, we have the client name, which will be optimizer job, SQL tuning advisor, et cetera. But also we have, for example, how much CPU has it used over the last seven days? What's the maximum duration over the last seven days? So if my auto stats job is running for say 30 minutes, then I, obviously I can reduce my window, window to say 45 minutes or an hour, safe in the knowledge that it probably isn't going to force this thing to t prematurely to stop. So to answer this person's question is, I'll keep the maintenance window on, looking at shifting it to perhaps a different time slot, which is a quieter period. Have a look at seeing, are you getting value out of each of the tasks, in particular the auto task for Space Advisor and SQL Tuning. If you're not, maybe look at disabling them or shrinking their windows down. Um, keep the optimizer stats one. Don't disable the whole lot, and hopefully that's gonna help you out. Okay, moving along. How do I set my SGA? Okay. That's a fairly, okay, this is all I've got to say on how to set my SGA. In Oracle 11, we came up with this awesomely incredible idea, which is set one parameter and that'll manage all your memory, right? It'll be your SGA, PGA, you just say, I got a box with 16 gigs of RAM, like this one's got, it's actually my laptop, six gigs for Oracle, don't have to worry about anything else. That's what in Oracle 11. And it was a disaster. So please don't do this. And there was a couple of reasons why. One is the usage profiles for SGA and PGA are really dramatically different. One is all about private information on, a, on probably a very volatile basis on a session by session basis. The other one is all about the opposite, shared memory, getting value for lots and lots of sessions and hopefully something that actually becomes quite stable over time. You know, the number of things in the library case, things in the buffer case, generally sort of melt, eventually form sort of an equilibrium point. So it's very different usage profiles for SGA and PGA. So the concept of saying they really should be merged and managed as one, probably wasn't such a great idea on our part, but we pushed it. And that's became, that was the default, as you can see in Oracle 11. So if you just install the database out of the box, you use what we call memory management. Um, and there's one parameter to do it. It also caused one other massive problem on the most popular platform, which is Linux. And that was one of the things that for any serious production level or, or you know, high activity database you want to be using is huge pages. It's an operating system enhancement to make the management of memory much, much more efficient. And when you use memory management with the one parameter, you couldn't use huge pages. Absolute disaster for high volume activity um, databases. And, and as an aside, I'd recommend Hue Pages across the board, no matter what platform you're using or what, um, what volume you've got on the database. Um, if your platform supports Hue Pages, you're generally going to see a benefit. So, 12, guess what? We realize our mistake. The default now in 12 is what we call automatic shared memory management. It's still a one size fits all, but we've separated SGA and PGA. You nominate one amount of memory for SGA, one for PGA, they're held separately. You can still choose automatic memory management, the old star one down the bottom there, but notice that it's actually not the default. 
which is a way of saying, we generally want you to steer clear of this. Um, and in particular, I think if you try and nominate more than a four gig database, um, four gig of RAM, we simply won't let you use automatic memory management because we're saying, hey, you know, if you're using four gig of RAM, it's generally not gonna be such a great idea. And if you're running a database less than four gig of RAM, you can see how many databases that pretty much covers. It's not many. So yeah, so for SGA sizing, my first thing is use this one, automatic shared memory management. So pick an SGA, pick a PGA. I don't see a lot of benefit, and feel free to um, disagree with me, um, in the manual shared management, which we used to do in the old days. You know, pick a shared pool, a buffer case, et cetera. Um, generally, the only time nowadays I see systems getting into trouble with the one size fits all is if they've actually cite that their CPU database cannot fit in the available resources. And what happens then is you start seeing this sort of jumping back and forth memory gets pinched from the shared pool to go into the buffer case, then it gets pinched back and it bounces back and forth. That's not an issue with shared memory management. That's an issue with not having enough resources to run your system. So out of the box for me, right, um, if, a, if a box is only going to be running Oracle, I'm generally going to allocate maybe upwards of 60% of the box's RAM to SGA and PGA combined. Um, and I'll carve up those two depending on my expected usage. Um, for a warehouse environment, um, it's amazing how much little buffer case you can sometimes get a benefit of. And you just crank it all into PGA so people can actually get some really good sorting and, and hash area benefits as well. Um, but yeah, so to answer the question, whoever asked it about SGA setup, use automatic shared manage, management um, and then keep an eye on the advisor. I find the advisor is pretty good. There's an SGA advisor, PGA advisor. Keep an eye on them and make adjustments as you go. Next question. Why is Ask Tom not taking any questions? That's cool. That's that's an easy one to answer. Let me let me show you how Ask Tom works. This isn't anything hidden or secret. This is what we do. So when I come into Ask Tom in the morning, I come into our admin screen, which you guys can't see, but this is how it works. And as you can see down the left here, right, this is this is what happens in Ask Tom. People ask questions. They go into this queue. We might have a look at some, and if there's one I want to answer later but haven't got time now, I'll put it. I'll say it's been read, but it hasn't been answered. If someone's even a question where we need more information, we'll flick it back to them, and it goes into there. These are ones that have come back from people with more info. Here's all the eighteen thousand questions you can see on Ask Tom if you go to the Ask Tom homepage, and here's the five and a half thousand that we've answered, but we didn't publish them because either the person logged sensitive information, they said please don't publish it or it's such an esoteric question that it probably isn't a lot of value, or sometimes it's a question which is just a big tired of profanity saying how much they hate us, and we answer it and we don't publish it. And no further action are ones where sometimes someone's just made a comment. In fact, we used to just get feedback this way, but now we have a dedicated feedback button at the top, um, et cetera. And then as people do reviews, you probably see reviews and ask Tom, we answer the reviews as well, and we've got 130,000 reviews. So how Ask Tom works is pretty simple. When this number gets above a certain threshold, we stop taking questions. It's not like because, it's not because we hate you. <laughs> it's, not, it's not being like that. It's simply because right, we don't want to get in the case of where we've got 100 outstanding questions because no one wants to have their question answered in nine months' time. That's not going to help you and just makes us look stupid. So by keeping a cap on the number of outstanding questions, so I think at the moment it's set to 20, I think, or maybe 15, once it gets to 15, we stop, hopefully so we can do a better service to those 15 questions. No one wants to have, wait six weeks for a question to be answered. So that's, that's the only reason why we don't take questions. When we get the number down, we open it up again. Um, for example, Chris has had the flu the last few days, so he's been down, so you know, we, we're down an, an answer. Maria's been traveling to conferences. I'm off to India in a, in a couple of weeks for Oracle Code. So we're just normal human beings. We do our, we do our best, but that's how we handle Ask Tom. Okay, and uh, next one. When will single tenant be de-supported? I have no idea. Um, but I think, let me, let me rephrase that question into, should I be using multi-tenant? Is probably the better question. It's like, if I'm, moving, if I'm upgrading to Oracle 12, should I use a non-tenanted database or a multi-tenant database or et cetera? Um, I would say my advice to you would be, to anyone, would be if you're moving to Oracle 12, use the multi-tenant database 
And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, hey, go spend some money on licenses. You know, you have a fantastic time spending, giving lots of money to Oracle. You know, if you're happily running 10 normal databases at the moment and you're going to move to 10 databases on Oracle 12, make each one of them a single tenant database. There's no cost for that. Um, rather than a non tenant database at all. Um, I don't really know. I don't think we even have a term for it. Was it a non CDB? Whatever. It's something that doesn't have any tenants. Um, the reason for that is pretty simple. Strategically, we're moving toward multi-tenant. All of our cloud databases, if you, you know, get stuff off our cloud, runs multi-tenant. Where do you think all the technological investment, all the best support, all the bug fixes are going to be targeted toward? It's that platform. Right? It doesn't make a lot of sense for anyone to maintain multiple code bases. Remember back in the days when Windows used to have Windows NT and Windows 95 or et cetera, or XP. Two separate code bases, one for server, one for desktop, and eventually they merged. You know, now generally all these things run a common sort of code base. Oracle's the same. It doesn't make a lot of sense for us to run a non-CDB set of architecture and a CDB architecture. It's hard, you know, we, we have to cover half the intelligence in the organization to each group. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So rest assured, eventually it'll only be the tenanted option. Now, I'm gonna try something. This is something I haven't tried before okay so this this is just a bit of fun i have two webcams so this is my second webcam hopefully everyone can see um shout out in the chat if you can't see the fact that there's a piece of paper and a pen sitting in front of this web book. here's why i think um moving to tenanted is a good idea so this is the standard diagram you've seen we say have a cdb and you'll have you know tenant number one tenant number two tenant number three and it'll all be fantastic and you're all going, yeah, that's all fantastic, except for that. You're gonna just kill me on licensing. Fair enough. But obviously, if you go this way, with one tenant in each database, there's no additional fee. Absolutely no additional fee, and you've got one tenant, at which point you're going, what does that get me? Gets me absolutely nothing. It is true that there's a whole stack of multi-tenant features, and hopefully you've been going to the um, Patrick's multi-tenant office hours things and asking questions about it, of things like snapshot, rolling carousel, instant cloning, all this really cool stuff with multi-tenant, but obviously you have to pay for it. If you can get value, I, I said this on the petitioning thing last month, if you can get value out of any option, then you should spend the money. If you can't get value out of it, don't spend the money. Don't just spend it because someone said it's a good idea. But here's my tip for why you want to be going single tenant. So here's a single tenant. Here's a single tenant. Without breaking your license, you can't put a second tenant into this database, but you can unplug this tenant and store it somewhere. I'll, I'll put it, you know, I'll, I'll give it a different look. You can unplug that tenant and store it somewhere and put another one in there. Why is that cool? Well, think about it, for example, as a developer. I can have, for example, a, I'll call it a gold image, a version of my de development database at application 2. Point, you know, my application is version 2.0. I'll store that out on the shelf. That's a pluggable 2.0 of my application. I can let someone bring that into that database just the one tenant, so not buying a license, and they can mess with it. They can do development against, they can do testing, unit testing, whatever. They can build version 2.1, right? Mess it up, break it, whatever. And then they go, okay, I'm, I'm reaching for more colors here. What have we got? Let's try blue. So I've messed it up, fine. I think I'm ready. I can ditch it. Blue doesn't work. Black. I can ditch it and bring a clean version of 2 back code back in and do some more testing. So this whole thing about, oh, I want to do agile, I want to actually spool up databases really fast. It's so common that the biggest thing that's a prob that the problem we have in, um, in systems is they say, oh, everyone has to share one database. Well, with a multi-tenant option, right, with multi-tenants like this, you could actually very easily have a whole stack of pre-delivered pre or pre-built pluggables on the shelf, so to speak. As long as they're not concurrently in databases, you'll be okay. Have them out on the shelf and you can ship them into your database as required. 
And in particular, let me rip this page off. What's coming out later this year? 18C Express Edition. It will have all options enabled, right? 100% free, limits on the size and everything like normal XE, but all the options are there. You can have greater than one pluggable database in there. You can have in memory, you can have compression, you can have everything. So as a developer, I can have pluggables in my own little version of 18CXE, work on my system privately, unplug a database from there and plug it into my main development database out here in my departmental server somewhere when I need to ship things in. That's why I think having a tenancy system, even if you're only running one tenant, is actually a cool idea. Now, it's actually 3.30, so it's almost time to go, but um, please um, excuse me about my pronunciation, but if it's Arcana, if you're still on, um, just if you can't, just put an X in the chat line if you're still on. Um, if you are, I'll talk to you about full database cache and the others can either hang around or they can go away. I don't mind, you can take pick. I obviously like just chatting constantly. So, um, okay, Akana's online, fine. So um, the rest of you, you're more than welcome to stay. Um, I'll keep chatting on because I could just never shut up. But if you, um, if you need to go now, thank you very much for attending. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, obviously I get a little bit excited about this kind of stuff and hopefully you are too. The recording will be made available um, shortly. Um, I'll just dump it out and, and stick it up on, on YouTube probably in the next few days or so. Thanks very much for coming. Um, please jump on to ask some listen feedback or in fact, I better do one last thing. Um, thanks for taking, please uh, follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel, jump onto my blog. Um, I love having people, especially on, my, on the videos. I love people's comments on the videos and how I can make them better and how I can make them more educational. Um, but yeah, so um, I'll leave that up there and I'll talk about full database case for anyone that wants to hang around. Thanks everyone. Okay, full database cache. Um, the cool thing about full database cache is one of the nice things with Oracle is this thing called the in-memory option. It's fantastic, right? You know, and you've probably seen plenty of content about it. Maria Colgan used to manage it now. We even have an in-memory office hours. It's awesome. And it's awesomely expensive. It's, a, I think it's about 50% add-on. And, and it's one of those things when, you know, people bag Oracle for how much we charge, but the reality is, you know, the value of something is what the market is prepared to spend. And in memory is one of those technologies which I've never seen a customer have a bad experience. All I've ever seen is great things with in memory. So understandably, we charge a premium for it. Unfortunately, it's very expensive. So people say, well, I've got this server and servers nowadays have stupid amounts of RAM. You know, you had these things where a server can have half a terabyte of RAM nowadays, even a terabyte of RAM. And the reality is, you know, with the exception of things like data warehouses, a lot of databases simply aren't that big. You know, they're in the hundreds of gigabytes, but you know, the, da the days of where a 10 gigabyte database was some scary thing you have to worry about are gone. You know, databases in the hundreds of gigabytes now don't even come close to realizing the power of the servers they're running on. So if I've got a box and I can't afford or choose not to spend on an in-memory option, can I get some better benefit from having all this available RAM for my database? If I've got a box with 500 gigs of RAM and my database is only 200 gigabytes, you know, why wouldn't I choose to try exploit that RAM more efficiently? And that's where two options come in, in terms of Oracle. Um, the first one I'll talk about is a thing called automatic large table caching. And the way that works is, is let me take a step back. By default, we assume that if you're gonna query huge tables, you probably don't want that stored in memory. That's by default. Because if you go back sort of 10 years, there was this sort of terrible thing where you've got all this precious data in memory. Um, in fact, let me, I think we've cleaned up all the blog URL and stuff. If you've got all this precious data in memory, then that's come from all these little reads of, of transactional data, someone does one big massive table scan and flushes it all out and the table's in memory, right? That's not what we want. So we introduced a lot of intelligence into the buffer cache algorithms, especially in 8.1, to make sure that the best data, the data that's more, most actively used stays in memory. So out of the box, if you scan a huge table, 
It's very unlikely we're going to keep it in memory. In fact, it's very unlikely we're even going to touch the buffer cache at all. We'll do a thing called a direct read, which simply takes the data straight off disk to that session that's requesting the data into their PGA. We bypass the buffer cache altogether. But even if we don't, that data that comes into the buffer cache is the first to get ditched. So that made a lot of sense when databases were this big and memory was this big. Now that it's flipped over, it's hot, you know, it might make more sense to say, when I scan a big table, if I've got huge amounts of RAM, let's keep it in there. Still without interfering with those precious small tables that are in the buffer cache all the time. So in, oh, I think it's from 12 on onwards, um, you can allocate a section of your buffer cache. So in, if my buffer cache is say 10 gig, I might say, well, I'll make it 60 gigs because I got all this spare RAM. The 10 gig stays the same and I'll allocate, well, I can choose a percentage. I can say, well, I can say 80% of my buffer cache is dedicated for what we call large table caching. But what happens now is when I scan large tables, they'll be dragged into that dedicated area. It's a dedicated chunk of the buffer cache for massive objects. And um, I can't remember the, the exact specifics of the terminology, but we recall what's called a temperature on these objects as in how actively they're, they're used. And that's what defines um, the usage algorithm as of when these things get purged out. But they get dragged in and they stay in there as long as possible until something else pushes them out. So that's the first element of caching the full database, this thing called large table, automatic large table caching, where you dedicate a part of your database to large objects. The next level up is more along the lines of this called full database caching. And it's simply the logical extension of that. It's still the database working in its conventional form. Right? There's no in-memory column store. There's no particular enhancements or risk factors. It's not like the whole database is caching memory. Therefore, if you shut it down, you're going to break things and lose data, etc. All the normal concepts of transactional integrity, persistence, read logs still apply. But you're telling the, the system that the entire database will be housed in memory. It's so, it's so small, your RAM is so large, that you don't have to worry about purging information out if necessary. So that's full database caching. I haven't seen a lot of people using it. Um, and I think that's perhaps because of a misinterpretation of the facility. People have sort of said, oh, this is like a version of times 10. It's effectively an in-memory database that never writes to disk and therefore it's incredibly fast. It's fast in terms of reads, but we're still using database protections, etc. It's not It's not a times 10 replacement. It's just an acknowledgement of the fact that RAM is so big nowadays that a lot of databases can actually just sit inside it and we can adjust our memory management algorithms to take advantage of that. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, it's 4.37 my time. My throat's just about toast. I'm gonna to say cheers to everyone. Thanks very much for attending. Um, and hopefully we'll see you next month, but please jump on the other office hours as well. Jump onto Twitter, say hello to me. Um, and um, yeah, hope to see you on YouTube as well. Take it easy everyone, enjoy the rest of your day.